Good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, for everybody uh, uh, we, we, at our uh, conference exercising Europe. And this is my really my big honor and, and pleasure to, to introduce our keynote speaker, Tara Zara. Uh, Tara is a Homer uh, Livingston Professor of Eastern European History at the University of Chicago. Uh, she is the author of uh, four books including most recently the great departure mass migration from eastern europe and the making uh, of the free world it was published in 2016 and with leora auslander objects of war the material culture of conflict and displacement it was published two years ago uh, and she's currently co-writing a book with peter Jackson on habsburg central europe during the first world war and is working on a study of anti-globalism and deglobalization in inter-war Europe. So welcome, Tara, the floor is yours, and we are really, really happy to have you here in our conference. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm really uh, delighted to be giving this talk as well. Obviously, I'm, I'm pretty sad that I'm not in Vienna. Um, also because uh, with the time difference, it was, it's been, I haven't been able to hear your presentation so far. So I'm hoping tomorrow morning um, with my childcare situation, I'll, I'll be able to tune in at least um, a bit. And I hope that what I'm about to say isn't totally redundant, um, given that you're, you're already in the midst of what I'm sure is a really um, interesting and stimulating discussion. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. I'll warn you, it's not a very exciting one. Mostly I've used it to highlight, uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about other people's work. Um, so mostly I've used it to give you the titles and uh, names of those books so that if you're interested or you don't know them, you can, uh, you know, have them have those references more easily. But um, let's see here. Here we go. Okay, is everybody seeing it? You can see the presentation. Okay, great. All right, so um, I'm gonna get started. Um, my understand, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards uh, as well. Um, so my understanding is that I'm here to try to offer some overarching thoughts on the ethnicization of Europe uh, in the post Versailles world. Um, and, and as I said, this is, a, this is a particularly welcome invitation because I think there's never been so much groundbreaking new research on this period as there is today. Um, thanks in part, of course, to anniversaries, which always generate new discussions, but also thanks to decades of excellent work by scholars um, that's called into question some of the basic assumptions about the legacy of Versailles in European and global history. And, so today I'm gonna to talk a bit about where we've been, how, where we've come and where we might be going in the study of East Central Europe in particular in this period. How have scholars already challenged the what, why and where of 1918? And then I'll speak a bit more about where uh, one of the directions at least that I think we might go next. Of course, there's I think many promising um, directions for future research. So once upon a time, as you all know, um, 1918, did this, the slide changed? Yeah, okay, hopefully. Uh, interrupt me if it, if it didn't. Yes, okay. Um, do a full screen presentation. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, thank you. I, it's never entirely clear to me what, um, let's see. Oh, perfect. Thanks. It's full screen now, but I can't see my own um, talk. So hold on. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh. Now it's not full screen again, I'm assuming. It's beautiful now. The, the question is whether you can find your talk as well. <laughs> okay, I have my talk and you can see this. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so um, one of my favorite quotes, uh, once upon a time, of course, as you all know, 1918, 
uh, and I mean, not just once upon a time, but still in uh, in uh, some scholarship, at least 1918 was celebrated uh, in nationalist historiography in terms of the triumph of national self-determination and democracy. Uh, Thomas Masaryk, the first president of the Czechoslovak Republic, famously declared that great multinational empires are an institution of the past, of a time when material force was held high and the principle of nationality had not yet been recognized because democracy had not yet been recognized. I love this quote because it shows so how these concepts of empire uh, democracy and nation were, were um, put together uh, at the time. But collectively, scholars have in the last 20 to 30 years really created a new paradigm for thinking about um, 1918 in East Central Europe and globally. Today, we have a, a very different and arguably much darker view of the legacy of Versailles and the concept of national self-determination. We can start with the question of uh, the questions of when, what, and who 1918 was all, all about and its legacies for the 20th century. So starting with when, um, there's always something artificial about turning points, even though um, I think we all would agree that 1918 was significant. Um, but we do know that the revolutions of 1918 in, in many respects began before 1918 and continued well after, as work on the greater war has emphasized. Both the positive achievements and the troubling legacies of the interwar successor states built on Habsburg institutions and precedents. The successor states inherited a functioning bureaucracy and legal system an ideal of the rule of law, which had uh, nevertheless been severely compromised during the war. A largely literate population that was informed of its political and civic rights, a fledgling welfare state and creative ways uh, of managing national conflict. But these new states also inherited a severe social crisis, a radicalized population, nationalist tensions, a view of uh, Roma and Jews as racial others and stark economic inequalities between different regions. Moreover, as scholars, including uh, Maureen Healy and Robert Gerworth have emphasized in the past uh, decade, uh, the war did not simply end in 1918. Violent struggles over borders, people and states continued for years after the armistice. Gerwarth, um, I think, has persuasively argued that these, the vanquished powers of the Great War inflicted some of the greatest havoc in Europe um, in the 20th century. It was in the East, he argues, including the former Habsburg lands, where bitterness and anger festered about the terms of the Versailles Treaty, where bloody revolutions were followed by even bloodier counter-revolutions, and where some of the most extreme and violent ideologies and practices of the 20th century uh, took root, including... Bolshevism, fascism, Nazism, communism, ethnic cleansing, political violence, and terrorism on the right and left. This leads to the question of what. So what was 1918 actually about? Um, historians have also uh, called into question some of our basic assumptions um, about, about the what of 1918 in the last decades especially with respect to Masaryk's argument that the end of the Habsburg monarchy represented the end of empire uh, uh, in Central Europe. Yes, 1918 was a moment in which the nation state was consecrated as the privileged state form in Europe, but empire really didn't go anywhere. Um, and this was in spite of the fact, of in spite of the fact, of course, that anti-colonial nationalists around the world tried and failed to use the language of self-determination to win their own independence. Some Habsburg citizens uh, as, were actually longing for the continuation of empire, as Dominique Ryle has shown in her recent study of Fiume. The people of Fiume, she argues, were less motivated by the soaring nationalist rhetoric of their poet leader than by an active desire for imperial continuity. The Habsburg Empire had provided them with a great deal of local autonomy, respected the city's multinational character and enabled the port to develop into an important economic role linking the hinterland of the empire to the Adriatic and the global economy. In the aftermath of the First World War, many citizens of Fiume imagined that their best chances of retaining what they saw as these imperial advantages lay with Italy rather than Yugoslavia. Meanwhile, the Habsburg successor states uh, were in, 
some ways even more imperial than their predecessor. Specifically, they sought to colonize borderlands, expand their territories, and govern populations unequally. Um, and I'll return to that theme later. When it comes to what we might call democratization, of course, that's a really difficult term to identify um, in a way that's not kind of an ideal type. But the successor states did make tangible gains, including the extension of suffrage to women in, in many contexts, new forms of economic development, the expansion of welfare states, and new rights for workers. But within a framework of nationalist democracy, in, in which rights often accrued to members of a privileged national community, these gains sometimes came at the expense of those excluded from that community. Literature on national indifference has also called into question the who and what of 1918. Was it even about nationalization? If so, who was nationalized and why? More than 60% of the Slovene speaking population of Southern Carinthia voted to join Austria rather than Yugoslavia in a 1920 plebiscite. In Silesia to the north, many Polish speakers preferred to remain in Germany rather than join Poland. Their votes, like resist, the resistance of people in Fiume, reflected uncertainty about the future of these new states, as well as a desire to maintain accustomed economic and social networks that would have been disrupted by annexation. Clearly, the space for national indifference uh, narrowed uh, if dramatically after 1918, in part because states forced people to choose sides. But whether or not one agrees that indifference was widespread, um, I would say there has been a turn in the last decade or so, um, at least, to seeing nationalist violence and conflict as a consequence of nationalization, rather than as a preordained or inevitable consequence of national linguistic or confessional diversity. Maureen Healy and Claire Morallone demonstrate the extent to which the fall of the Habsburg Empire itself was not necessarily a product of nationalist conflict at all, but rather of social conflicts exacerbated by the First World War. And as Mark Cornwall, Iris Rakamimov, John Dayak, and Jonathan Gums have argued, the dissolution of imperial loyalties were partly the result of the Habsburg state's own militarization, its abandonment of national impartiality and the rule of law during the war. Finally, when it comes to what caused violence and hatred, a lot of recent scholarship has helped us to root both, both violence and hatred in very local contexts. Why do people hate each other based on membership in a national or racial group? Why do they attack and kill each other, destroy their property? Uh, a few works that have recently shed light on these questions uh, include Dan Unowski's The Plunder, um, Peter Judson's Guardians of the Nation, and Max Baerkoltz's Violence as a Generative Force. What do we learn from this work? Uh, first, nationalism was sometimes a product of boredom. Local violence, such as drunk kids throwing stones at school windows, was often sensationalized by what Rogers Brubaker has called ethnic entrepreneurs, which in turn radicalized people further. Mass politics and the emerging sensational press were key here. You gained followers by presenting yourself as more radical than the next person. Second, uh, a lesson for our own time, rumors and conspiracy theories were instrumental in fomenting violence. In the Galician context, this included emperors that the rumors that the emperor himself had sanctioned violence against Jews. Third, uh, violence in the name of the nation was often a way of resolving other kinds of lo local conflicts, grievances against a neighbor or competing business. Fourth, violence snowballs. Uh, it creates more violence and reinforces national loyalties and hatred. At the same time, it's highly situational. Um, and here, kind of following from Rogers Brubaker, a lot of scholars have turned towards seeing nationality less as an, an identity and more as an event. Finally, it matters a lot how states responded. Um, when states intervened decisively, fewer people died. And this can be seen by comparing the relatively low death tolls of the 1898 anti-Semitic uh, violence in Galicia, which with the much higher death toll of anti-Jewish violence in 1918 and 19. But if local context is essential, so is the global context. And that's where I'd like to turn um, to consider some possible next steps in studying ethnicization, violence, and hatred after uh, in the wake of Versailles. 
Um, in the rest of my talk, uh, I want to suggest that we can sharpen our interrogation of 1918 by thinking more about the where of 1918, as well as the what, when, and who. The post-Versailles legacy included more than the dissolution of an empire and the ethnicization of populations, but I would argue the racialization of populations in a framework of global racial hierarchies. And I'll talk um, a lot about why I think um, terminology makes a difference here. Writing in uh, 1921, Robert Musil uh, remarked on the extent to which the terms nation and race had become coterminous uh, since 1918, in his view. He wrote, there cannot be many people who have directly asked would equate na nation with race. Everyone knows that nations are racial mixtures. But strangely enough, the concept of race is nonetheless constantly substituted quite unabashedly for the concept of nation. And people make use of race as if it were as straightforward as the concept of the cube. Now in critiquing the um, association of race and nation, Musil clearly nonetheless reinforced what he saw as the commonsensical notion that distinctive races actually existed and that nations were somehow composed of them. But he also pointed out the extent to which the racialization of society had gone to ludicrous extremes. He, quote, he wrote, if ordinary tables were at a given moment to begin multiplying by propagation rather than by being ordered from a manufacturer, we would immediately see a rising from the now living tables and on the same evidence by which we recognize a, a Frisian as a Frisian, races of four-legged square tables, one-legged oval tables, and more. For our purposes, I want to use Musil's remarks as a reminder that people were thinking of race when they spoke of nations after World War I. Historians, however, I think have arguably obscured the racialization of nationalism through our own use of the terms ethnicization and ethnic nationalism, terms that I think we might want to consider abandoning or at the very least um, using uh, very critically. The history of racialization is itself uh, a global and uh, transatlantic story. Beginning in the 19th century, US immigration authorities drew on a concept of race defined by blood quantum that had been used to define African-Americans domestically and applied it to migrants coming from Europe. So they assumed that a person with one German grandparent and three English grandparents was somehow one fourth German and three fourths English. Uh, I think all of you will be familiar with the way that kind of language um, still dominates the popular imagination of how people talk about their genealogy and ancestry um, in a moment when genealogy and ancestry is, is kind of a booming uh, hobby and business. By 1900, immigration officials classified immigrants from the Habsburg Empire as member of several distinctive races. Uh, including Bohemian and Moravian, uh, Croatian and Slovenian, Dalmatian, Bosnian and Herzegovinan, Pole, Slovak, and Hebrew. Nicole Phelps uh, has shown uh, in her interesting work that Habsburg authorities contested these forms of classification. Austrian officials wanted uh, emigrants from the Habsburg Empire, from the Austrian part of the Habsburg Empire, simply to be recorded as Austrians. But US officials rejected this demand because Austrian, quote, was not a race name. It has no significance as to the physical race or language. Things changed, however, uh, after the First World War, both in the US and in Europe. Um, as May Nye has shown, as immigration authorities sought to create a barrier against the immigration to the United States of foreigners deemed non-white, they started to refer to migrants from Eastern and Southern Europe as members of ethnic groups and migrants from outside of Europe as members of racial groups. White people supposedly had ethnicities, non-white people had races, uh, and significantly they also lacked uh, national origins. They weren't classified. Um, by where, for example, where they came from in Africa, simply as uh, Black. However, and this is key, both concepts, national origins or ethnicity and race, were still presumed to be, quote, immutable and transhistorical, passed down through generations without change. Both terms were racialized. 
But by continuing to talk about East Europeans in terms of ethnicity and non-Europeans in terms of race, we perpetuate a racialized distinction between Europeans and non-Europeans that was invented in part in the service of racial exclusion. There are other problematic consequences of uh, the term ethnicity or of the use of the term ethnicity. As Jeremy King argued um, in a really important article, the term ethnicity has been used by scholars of nationalism specifically and by social scientists since the early 20th century to soft pedal primordialism. Talking about ethnicity was a convenient way of carving out a middle ground between a view of nationality as a biological fact and a view of it as a cultural construct. This echoed, of course, the early 20th century use of ethnicity to refer to European migrant groups. Ethnicity uh, basically is a racialized concept that was invented to classify a person such as a Jew or a Slav who was seen to be on the, located on the borderlands of whiteness. And like race, ethnicity is not something generally considered mutable. For example, we don't use the phrase cultural ethnicity because it would sound like a contradiction in terms, nor do we use the term racial ethnicity because it would be redundant. But we do talk about ethnic nationalism. Um, and this is another phrase that, uh, that I worry about because it often implicitly assumes that there is another form of nationalism that is purely cultural and benign. Um, that's a distinction that goes way back in nationalism scholarship, uh, of course, to theorists like Hans Kohn, who distinguished between the ethnic nationalisms of Central Europe and the civic nationalisms of places like the United States and France. And this distinction has been criticized from many, many angles, theoretical and empirical, um, in the last couple of decades. Uh, I don't think anyone could seriously argue today that the nationalism of the United States in after 1918, a period that included the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, which directed its attentions increasingly against uh, immigrants and Jews, as well as black people, immigration restriction, Jim Crow and anti-Semitic exclusion was civic in nature, or that nationalism in Central Europe for that matter was ever entirely ethnic. My own research on minority rights in 1918 in France and Czechoslovakia suggested that in France, the criteria for proving one's Frenchness was arguably more based on descent or ideas of race than in Czechoslovakia, where national malleability was an accepted if lamented social fact. So what do we gain with the term ethnic nationalism? Why not just call it nationalism and acknowledge that all forms of nationalism beginning in the late 19th century contained both racial and cultural elements. I don't want to dismiss the possibility that there could uh, someday in some ideal place be a genuine form of civic nationhood or an ideal of civic nationhood. But to me, this does seem more like an ideal than a description of uh, historical reality. Finally, I think that the use of the terms ethnicization and ethnic na nationalism serve uh, implicitly to distance the nationalisms of East Central Europe from later Nazi formulations in some problematic ways. Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia had ethnic conflict while Germany had a racial state. When Poles or Romanians engaged in anti-Semitic violence or passed anti-Semitic legislation, we often label this as ethnic conflict. When Germans did the same thing, we call it racial persecution. While the Nazi state took racial anti-Semitism to the point of genocide, all of these interwar states saw the rise of racial anti-Semitism, eugenic policies, and racial nationalism. Instead of talking about ethnicization and ethnic nationalism, terms that localize or orientalize and to some extent obscure East European racism, I suggest that we should start talking more about racialization and the place of East Central Europe in global racial hierarchies. Okay. Eris Manella um, has argued that anti-colonial activists around the world were specifically invested in a Wilsonian language of national self-determination. Well, Adam Getachew uh, recently uh, wrote a book in which she claimed that uh, what she calls world making uh, rather than nation building was the concern of anti-colonial activists. Neither of these authors look specifically at Eastern Europe, but in 1918, Eastern Europe argue, occupied a very important place uh, 
in um, what I'm thinking of as the imagined borderlands of whiteness. This liminality had real institutional, social, and political consequences. The fate of East Central Europe was defined in part uh, in 1918 by its perceptions that its inhabitants were almost but not quite white and European, almost but not quite worthy of sovereignty, almost but qu not quite racially acceptable as immigrants in Western Europe and North America. And this had real institutional and social consequences internationally and locally. So in the time that remains, um, I'd like to offer a few more examples of 1918 as a story of global racialization that transcended the borders of the region itself. One of the first cues uh, that people were thinking about race in a global context in Central Europe in 1918 is the fact that the language of slavery was absolutely ubiquitous. In Graz, German nationalists addressed a telegram to Wilson in which they expressed their outrage at the terms of the peace treaty, which will quote, make us a nation of slaves, deprive us of every possible means of making a living and strike a blow to the face of the most basic human rights. A telegram issued by a gathering of members of the Austrian Christian Social Party in May 1919 proclaimed its opposition to the ensurfment of the German Austrian people. They warned, we will not allow ourselves with our wives and children to be sentenced to death or eternal slavery, but demand fairness, humanity, and justice. If the Entente wants to prepare a grave for us, all of Europe will be destroyed with us. Why all these references to slavery? And these are just a few examples. Um, of course, one could say it was just a convenient polemical language, but it wasn't entirely a coincidence. This was actually the language Wilson himself used as uh, Larry Wolf has um, shown in his uh, recent book. In spite, or perhaps because of being a Southern segregationist um, who segregated the federal government in the United States, Wilson really liked to fashion himself as the Abraham Lincoln of Eastern Europe, emancipating um, what he referred to as slaves from the rule of autocratic empires. By invoking the language of slavery in their protests, East Europeans were appealing to Wilson's sensibilities and positioning themselves firmly on the white side of a global racial divide. But they didn't succeed. On the one hand, unlike African-Americans in the US South, unlike British and French colonial subjects in Asia and Africa, and unlike most former Ottoman subjects, um, residents of the former Habsburg Empire were considered worthy of national self-determination, at least in theory. On the other hand, that self-determination and sovereignty, even though for those groups who didn't end up as um, minority groups in, in the new successor states, was severely compromised institutionally in multiple ways that reflected a perception that the former subjects of the Habsburg Empire were not quite civilized, not quite white, and not quite mature enough um, for complete self-government. They enjoyed what Adam Gedichu has called burdened membership in the League of Nations and in the Club of European Powers. The great powers that controlled the League were all empires, and many of those states that enjoyed burdened membership also aspired to be empires. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and as Peter Judson and others have uh, discussed and shown recently, interwar nationalists may have rhetorically insisted that they uh, had been liberated from the yoke of the Habsburg Empire, but they behaved as though they were governing miniature empires, empires that were perhaps more centralizing and hierarchical and certainly more racialized uh, than the deposed Habsburg rulers had been. In borderland territories that were stigmatized as backward and or nationally and politically unreliable, several of the successor states undertook many civilizing missions of their own. In interwar Poland, Catherine Ciancia has shown how border guards, settlers, teachers, local officials, and even Boy Scouts streamed into Volhynia, recently annexed from the USSR in order to modernize and civilize the region. They debated whether the Ukrainians and Jews that inhabited that region were mature enough to handle democratic participation, for example. Armies of bureaucrats and teachers were also dispatched from Prague to rural Sil Slovakia and to the Subcarpathian Rus, where they were often greeted as colonial invaders. Natasha Wheatley has called Central Europe in 1918 a ground zero for the articulation of a new international order. 
But this international order was simultaneously a, re a reformulation of an older imperial order as work on the League of Nations has shown. Beyond the League's authority over um, the new mandates created from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire, the League often functioned as a replacement for the former Habsburg Empire and as a semi-colonial power in East Central Europe. I cannot uh, recommend this recent volume enough. It's got fantastic essays on um, the League in the former Habsburg successor states um, and that I'm drawing from in, in some of the examples I'm, I'm discussing here. So for example, the League's financial reconstruction of Austria required the Austrian government to open its books, uh, its accounting books to a League commissioner as loans for reconstruction were contingent on implementing austerity measures that were deemed necessary by outside auditors. This kind of external financial control of a sovereign state's budget had previously only been attempted in colonial contexts. That was not lost on League officials or Austrians, as Jamie Martin has shown. Austrians protested being subject to what they called Tunisification or Ottomanization or reduced to a Madagascar. League officials, meanwhile, debated how to make this unprecedented intervention into the financial affairs of a European sovereign state appear less like a form of colonial or imperial domination. The semi-colonial status of the successor states was also reinforced by swarms of international humanitarian workers who flooded the region after the war. In the face of uh, Famine condition, Herbert Hoover's American Relief Administration and the International Save the Children Fund, both founded in 1919, emerged among the most important efforts to combat hunger in Central Europe. The ARA penetrated the tiniest villages of Central and Eastern Europe through a network of committees and soup kitchens. And while theoretically focused on uh, feeding starving children, Hoover's mission embraced a civilizing uh, mission as well from the outset. Its representatives sought to deliver American values of self-help, efficiency, and cross-class solidarity, along with, a surplus, with the surplus wheat and corn that they were exporting from the US. Hoover believed that his soup kitchens could heal what he saw as the festering wounds of class division in Europe and thereby prevent the Russian Revolution from spreading West. Quote, a princess stirring broth in a soup kitchen is the best argument for democracy that could possibly be found. It was through this kind of service that we were able to stave off anarchy. But along with American values and anti-communism, humanitarian workers brought their prejudices to Eastern and Central Europe, depicting the region and its people as inherently backward, violent, and corrupt in opposition to American modernity and efficiency. These prejudices undercut their stated goal of facilita facilitating self-help, but reinforced the status of the Habsburg successor states as semi-colonial protectorates. Encounters between relief workers uh, and locals sometimes left humanitarian activists questioning whether East Europeans were even human and certainly racialized them. One Save the Children field worker reported that in the Subcarpathian Rus in Czechoslovakia in 1920, quote, the squalor is beyond belief. Six or seven people, if one can call them people, in one stuffy room, and a half dozen hens or rabbits besides. Idiots and cretins abound. Finally, the semi-independent status of the successor states was concretely embedded in the minority treaties that the successor states were required to sign in exchange for their independence or territorial aggrandizement. These treaties oblige signatories to protect national minorities within their borders and submit to external scrutiny by a league committee. But only the new states created at the end of the war were required to sign these treaties. The hypocrisy of the great powers was not lost on the citizens of the new Central and East European states. Before the war ended, a Viennese newspaper speculated that the allies would be as eager as the central powers for peace given their own minority problems. Um, and that they would be sympathetic, writing, quote, the Irish and Indian questions plague the British global empire no less than the Czech and South Slav questions plague us. But when in 1922, Lithuania proposed that all member states of the League of Nations adopt universal standards of minority protection for all members, a French delegate responded, quote, France has no minorities. Armed with an ethnographic map, a Romanian delegate disagreed only to receive the reply, minorities only exist where there is a treaty. 
According to contemporary logic, members of minority groups in Western Europe or the United States did not need protection because these societies were fully civilized and fully uh, democratized. East Europeans, by contrast, could not be fully trusted with self-government. One of the most influential players at Versailles, Jan Smuts, president of South Africa, argued that the, a mandate system should be applied uh, uh, to Europe, to Eastern Europe, um, to train East Europeans for full sovereignty. The people left behind by the decomposition of Russia, Austria, and Turkey are mostly untrained politically. Uh, many of them are either incapable or deficient in the power of self-government. And of course, Sorry, but that is a kind of small revolution in the background because your pre uh, presentation, your PowerPoint doesn't uh, move. So the question is whether you can show us the slides <laughs> because oh. we are still uh, in Hannah Arendt's quotation. Oh my goodness, okay. No, it's okay. You know, I, I think it's best not to just go on without it because um, I, you know, I'm almost at the end of the presentation. Um, and like I said, most of the slides were, were just kind of pictures of book covers. So uh, it's nothing, it didn't add a whole lot, um, but I, I, I do apologize. Uh, I will stop the share and just talk to you. Um, and I'm happy to type references in the chat or send them to people if, if you're looking for them. Um, so, of course, um, of course, it was not coincidental at all that the great powers didn't sign the minority treaties. They were very explicitly concerned that African Americans in the South, uh, colonial subjects, and other minority groups would use these treaties to uh, foment dissent. Of course, I would also say we shouldn't oversimplify the relationship um, between the League and other organizations and East Europeans and, and the volume I pointed to by uh, Natasha Wheatley and Peter Becker on um, the League in Central Europe that you couldn't see the cover of um, does this very well. Um, there are a lot of interesting examples of local officials and uh, experts using international organizations, including the League, to build national institutions and infrastructure or even strengthen national sovereignty. So one example of such a partnership um, between international institutions and local state builders was the League's health organization run by Ludwig Reichmann, a Polish Jew. As Sarah Silverman has shown, he and his colleagues used the League's resources along with those of the Rockefeller Foundation to strengthen the public health infrastructure of the new Polish state building new hospitals, sanitary stations, and child welfare clinics. So this is not only a story of imperial meddling and domination, but even here, race was a critical factor. Western organizations were willing to invest so much in public health in the Habsburg successor states in order to stop the transmission of epidemic diseases, which they associated with dirty and backwards Jews migrating from Russia and Eastern Europe. Racialization, um, moreover, was not simply imposed on Eastern Europe by international authorities or the allies. It also reshaped legal definitions of nationality and citizenship domestically um, within Central Europe after 19, as work by Gerald Storz and his students has shown. For example, take Article 80 of the 1918 Treaty of Saint-Germain, the so-called option clause. It was intended to address situations in which an individual citizenship and nationality were not aligned, essentially allowing voluntary unmixing. It enabled, in theory, citizens of the former Habsburg Empire who differed by, quote, race and language from the majority population to opt for citizenship in another successor state, so long as that state was populated by persons speaking the same language and having the same race. In practice, self-identified Germans were most likely to take advantage of the clause. Approximately 180,000 German families totaling uh, more than 500,000 people from the former Austrian crown lands opted to become citizens of the first Austrian Republic. Race was not the only predictor of exclusion. All of the successor states were inclined to reject applications from individuals who were considered undesirable, including communists, the poor, and retirees. 
States readily accepted wealthy applicants as well as men of military age, but were reluctant to naturalize the poor or individuals considered politically troublesome. The result was that hundreds of thousands of former Habsburg citizens became stateless after 1918. But it's no coincidence that a large number of these stateless people were former Jewish refugees. And in this case, exclusion was justified on explicit racial grounds. In 1921, the Austrian Supreme Court defined race as an inborn, inherent, physically and psychically determined quality quote, that cannot be removed at will or changed according to preference. On the basis of this definition, the Austrian Interior Ministry proceeded to reject almost all Jews from the Austrian successor states who attempted to opt for Austrian citizenship, around 75,000 people on the grounds that they did not belong to the German race. The League of Nations Minority Council ultimately supported Austria's decision, which was uh, challenged by Poland, because Poland didn't want these Jews to come back to Poland, uh, ruling that, quote, Austria is fully justified based on local and international law to exclude Eastern Jews. This should, however, take place with consideration of humanitarian principles. Another reason, of course, that Europe faced such a severe crisis of statelessness in the 1920s and 30s was that the US, which had welcomed millions of immigrants before World War I, instituted its own new racialized immigration restrictions. In the US, the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act uh, created a quota system that discriminated heavily against migrants from Eastern and Southern Europe on racial grounds. The number of people leaving East Central Europe declined dramatically. The Polish quota in 1924 was around 25,000, even as more than 100,000 Poles per year were requesting emigration visas, uh, many hoping to join family members who are already there. As I've argued in my previous work, migration politics after World War I were shaped by a desire within Central Europe as well, though, to create more racially homogenous states. Um, so this was kind of a goal on both sides of the Atlantic. Through the emigration of national and linguistic minorities and the return of nationally reliable and productive citizens from abroad, Central European officials hoped to transform their own multinational states into more homogenous nation states. In Poland, for example, new passport restrictions in 1920 hindered the emigration of Poles, but the Polish Interior Ministry simultaneously decreed that Jews should be encouraged to emigrate in the interests of the Polish Republic, um, and the same went for Ukrainians. The Polish government also expressed its support for the Zionist cause throughout the interwar period, declaring its, quote, special interest in the emigration of Jews from Poland um, as early as 1919. These Policies, uh, I think, easily facilitated a shift in the 1930s toward actively encouraging or forcing the mass emigration of Jews from Eastern Europe, a project that Zionist Western leaders, humanitarian organizations, and government officials in East Central Europe all agreed on some level was necessary. Theodore Achilles of the U.S. Department of State insisted in 1938, quote, the problem of refugees from Germany, great as it is, is merely a small part of the problem presented by the existence of 7 million unwanted Jews between the Rhine and the Russian frontier. A basic solution of the larger problem would unquestionably be a major contribution to European stability and world peace worth using heroic measures to achieve. My purpose here is not to suggest that 1918 was the trailhead uh, of a special path to the Holocaust, but in order to understand the events of the 1930s and 40s in Eastern Europe, we do have to come to terms with the extent to which 1918 represented more than a localized ethnicization of nationalism within the region. Violence was indeed always rooted in local, regional, and national conflicts and contexts, but it was also supported by a global edifice of racial hierarchies and ideologies. East Central Europe has often been referred to as a borderland, the entire region. It has also been known as the other Europe, the shatter zone of empire or the lands in between. Uh, for Timothy Snyder, these are the bloodlands plagued by violence because of their position in between fascism and Bolshev Bolshevism, Hitler and Stalin. I want to suggest that we should pay equal attention to another kind of in-betweenness or liminality that has profoundly shaped Central and Eastern European history, 
The Habsburg successor states in this period were trapped in the imaginary borderlands of whiteness, someplace between colonizer and colonized, civilization and backwardness, white and not white, Europe and not Europe. 1918 was a moment when this liminal status was institutionalized and anchored in the international order. In the process, East Europeans became both racialized and racializers. For the remainder of the 20th century and arguably into the 20th first, East Europeans would continue to claw their way up and slide down the chutes and ladders of this global racial order. And that's where I'm gonna stop, thanks. So thank you so much for this great and uh, extremely complex and uh, uh, inspiring lecture. And I just uh, want to open the, the floor for discussion because I think they, they have many points which we can discuss and we have already discussed some of the questions you already, already described us. Uh, my point is uh, far from the historical uh, perspective, so I will wait. Let's start with the historical questions and then I would like to put some ethnographical questions on, on, on the category of ethnicity. So who wants to start? I will check the chat box, but we have the, the uh, organ, organ, organization, organizers here in the room. So Raul, Gabor, if you want to start, uh, you, yeah, you can. Well, thank you very much. I, I guess I can start. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting um, keynote. Um, my question, I, I know I've, I've missed parts of it. Sorry, it's the, it's the trouble, I guess, of being an organizer and, and doing other things while things are going on. Uh, I have missed parts of it. So if, if in, in case my questions have been answered by your talk at, at some points where I wasn't in the room, uh, I do apologize. I've, I'm, in an article I've written, I've taken a similar approach to these global racial hierarchies. Uh, and I've tried to read the minority treaties in conjunction with the mandate system at Versailles as, as, as evidence of such racial hierarchies uh, playing out on a, on a much broader scale than just Central and Eastern Europe and just the European leftovers of the, of the collapsed empires. But in the same article, I was looking at how the discourse on diversity coalesced, coalesces in 1918 from two separate but related discourses. One was humanitarianism and the other one was that of national rights. And I was trying to read the minority treaties and to read Versailles and this definition of ethnicity in the long Europe perspective that sees the, the, the sort of the, the different ways in which the two principles of, of you know, the rights of men, the national rights of uh, citizenship fundamentally, and humanitarianism, assistance to you know, the, the ones who are by definition in need of assistance from us, so somehow lower on the, on the racial hierarchy scale, uh, how these two actually, you know, from contenders throughout the 19th century and from imperial tools of, of managing difference, come together at Versailles and come together in, in, in various ways that shape this definition of ethnicity, of, of race, of, of I, I, I see it as, a, as the normative inscription of, of the nation state and of nationality as the be all and end all of, of politics, if you will. Um, but this is this doesn't come just from nationalism. That was, I think, well, the, the point I was trying to make in that, in that article, I, I read your, your presentation very much along the same lines, it comes equally from these global imperial hierarchies and it's it's shaped by the legacy of 19th century imperialism as much as it's shaped by, by nationalism as an ideology. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what you make of it and if this is along the lines you read, if, if we look back to the 19th century, what are the roots of these? Um, yeah, I guess that was my question. Thank you. That's a um, wonderful comment. I really look forward to reading your work, first of all, because it, it does sound like um, we have a lot of points of connection. Uh, and I would agree with you. Absolutely. I, I think part of the point I, I do want to make is that the um, the 
international order created in 1918 um, reflected the, I guess one could say the triumph of nationalism, but it also did, I think, uh, reflect the legacy of imperialism and humanitarianism. Um, and actually this conversation is now making me think of um, Eric Weitz's famous article and he just passed uh, this past week. So um, I don't know, it's a good moment to honor his contribution to this discussion. Um, but I, yeah, the, the entanglement of humanitarianism, uh, ideas of human rights uh, and ethnic cleansing and nationalism and uh, imperialism in this moment, I mean, it's so, um, they all come together uh, and sorting out exactly how is, is really complicated. Um, so uh, I, uh, but I think we do need to take a global perspective in order to see how all these um, pieces fit together. Thank you, Raul and Tara. Alex Korb uh, wants to comment or ask something. Oh, already. I, I thought I'd have <laughs> some more minutes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Tara, for, for a wonderful talk. And also thank you for, for honoring um, um, Eric, who passed. Um, I don't know if you if you attended the first panel or not, but he was mentioned um, or his work. Mentions often already in this first panel to show us how influential he was in a policy field. Also, I'm having a hard time hearing. Alex, that is my son. This time switch. I'll switch the. I'm sorry, I, I was having a hard time hearing. He's, he's, he's here again. Okay, good. Okay, now everybody knows that I'm in Vienna. <laughs> it's supposed to be a secret. Um, okay, so should I start all over again? Yeah. You, I heard you talk say that in the first panel you've um, discussed somewhat the legacy of Eric White's work, but then I don't think I got anything beyond that. Yeah, that was just this. I think uh, the many references to 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 Eric and uh, some of the speakers didn't even know that he passed away last week, and um, shows how how important and how influential he was in in our very own field, but in many other fields also. So thanks for, for honoring him. Um, my um, second uh, uh, thanks or appreciation goes out to your critical reading of how um, ethnicization is being used. And I found that a wonderful uh, part of, of your lecture and very, very inspiring. And my question though goes to the very last part of your lecture when you uh, mentioned um, how, the, 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 uh, how Eastern Central Europe sort of uh, struggles with um, whiteness, backwardness, and being European or not. And I was just wondering if that's not a little bit too sort of, um, or if that that perspective on Eastern Central Europe is not um, downplaying a little bit or neglecting a little bit the enthusiasm that 1919 uh, brought about um, and and so why would they doubt being part of Europe uh, in, in a very moment where they actually felt so European and celebrated sort of their belonging to, to um, the, the modern European world? So I was wondering if, if there are really this, that intensive discussions about who are we at this point in time? Thank you so much. That's a yeah. That's a great. Um, that's a great question. I think um, to sort of take the the argument to a more um, empirical level, it would be very interesting to kind of um, to think to look at celebrations of 1918 in in say you know Czechoslovakia in particular, Poland, and um, the extent to which that language of being European is, is invoked. Um, and I, I suspect it is. Um, so 
Um, but you know, it's interesting to me. I, I think the two things could coexist. That that on the one hand, one could be celebrating this moment of recognition as being European, um, at the same time that the celebration is in itself a claim that's being made, um, you know, locally and and internationally, um, and also kind of be an intense discussion you know, in back in Paris or um, in the context of these um, encounters with humanitarian organizations or international organizations over what that status entitles you to and um, and your treatment as an equal, it, you know, in fact, after the after the treaties are signed. So um, I, but I think that your point is is a is a really good one, and it complicates the the picture that I gave. Um, and of course, it would depend a lot on where you know, like Austria, the the losers, the, those who perceive themselves to be losers, would have a different rhetoric than those who um, perceive themselves to be winners. Um, but thank you. That's a, yeah, great point. Thanks so much. Gabor, Gabor is the next uh, from our beautiful group because we are now three and it's something absolutely unique. Well, this is a colleague. Yes. Fighting the late profile. So, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this wonderful uh, keynote lecture. Uh, and it was really insightful, especially uh, regarding, uh, at least uh, for me, how we can use. Uh, the concept of race and racism to somewhat resituate this uh, Eastern European uh, region uh, in this post uh, period. Uh, I would make two comments. Uh, first, uh, uh, kind of corroborating what you have said about the liminality, but emphasizing more those elements of these external actors that I think also demonstrated they were somehow aware of this liminality as well. So you mentioned the ERA's activities and you focused on the civilizing aspects that was very strongly dis discursively. But if you look at the practical activities, there are at least two elements that to me suggest that the people on the ground, probably also in the center, see the region more differentiated. The, the one is the specific intelligentsia relief. Because the reason behind intelligentsia relief was that there was a middle class that was supposed to be strong enough to uphold these civilized states in the face of the Bolshevik threat as well. So there's no need to create the intelligentsia just to strengthen it. And the second one is the different exit strategies that much very much, much better fit to this racialization uh, concept because if you look at what the ERA uh, expected from Romania before they exited that was just setting up something there which resembled a civic association of their own child welfare and where they had better experiences with working the local actors and with the state they actually insisted on extended welfare legislation or child welfare legislation. So there is a clear difference here. And I think it very much supports uh, what you mentioned, but just demonstrates how the external actors are aware of this, of this difference. And the second one is uh, connected with Natasha Vitti's work, but I will start from the uh, nation state group and how in the light of this wonderful uh, presentation, I think uh, I would try to reconceptualize this mini empire nature of these nation states. Because I think one can argue that uh, the normative aspect of this nation statehood, of which Raul also uh, thought, uh, uh, was much stronger than in the case of the empires, which were not self purposed nation states, while, uh, while these nation states somehow relied uh, still on these practices, how to manage differentiated populations. And one can make the argument that this kind of tension that was much more manifest and much more problematic for the nation state uh, made them trying to find the means of eliminating much more quickly mm -hmm. this kind mm -hmm. of gap between the functional statehood and the normative statehood. And I think here it's one can argue that also the temporalities, which Natasha Weekly argues much more in terms of the legal system, is also that could be the temporalities of uh, knowledge 
and knowledge accumulation, much more modern notions of race and mm -hmm. much more traditional notions of ethnicity, some kind of ethnographic knowledge, which is also differentiated and very often uh, looks at uh, people as objects for being civilized to a certain extent, but still has some kind of different roots. So maybe we can complicate this kind of temporality issue with that kind of temporalities, and that could really well grasp this very complex situation. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. I, I mean, I don't really have a reply. I think those are I, I, the points about what, you know, how the the nuance that you gain from looking more closely at what the ARA is doing um, bureaucratically, who they think they can work with and not, and the conditions of exit, that's, you know, really brilliant, um, seems right. Um, and I, I like the idea of thinking about uh, you know, I, I think in this talk, I thought a lot about scale, like what happens when we shift scales from the local to the global. Um, but temporality is equally important. And the, and um, that's something I, I didn't think about, but I think you're right, would um, kind of enrich and complicate the, the story when it comes to uh, the differences be between these different kinds of states and what they imagine, the futures they imagine. I think this is exactly the moment uh, if you mention the scale that I can maybe put my question, which is a rather ethnographical one. You mentioned Roger Brubaker's definition of ethnicity, but it's rather a, a historicized or politicized definition of ethnicity. And uh, we use uh, other definitions of ethnicities like Frederick Barth. Mm -hmm. or the Ocean School of uh, uh, Ethnicity, which means a totally different uh, um, living together with a kind uh, small place uh, using the different languages and different habits, but still having a kind of local knowledge or a local uh, loyalty. But this loyalty is absolutely different. Uh, uh, it's not a kind of national. And on the other hand, using the, the scale or Frederick Barth's uh, logic of understanding, what does it mean, ethnicity, then it's a kind of ongoing negotiation. So I just want, I, and I know it's absolutely complicated to put into your framework because it's a big, it's a big picture. But I wonder whether you could think about it and, uh, and give some advance for us how we can put these observations of the same population or the same people uh, trying to negotiate ethnic boundaries, trying to, to rationalize the everyday practices, having taking advantages from living together and redefining ethnic boundaries, which is a kind of art historical, anthropological, Thing. It's so, so it's rather on that kind of anthropological, societal uh, uh, creativity of human being and not absolutely historical one. So how we can put this perspective, this ethnographical, anthropological perspective into your, into your con concept? Yeah, I mean, this is a kind of um, question that I, I guess I expected, but don't quite know how to answer. So the question being, um, is it possible, I mean, this is how I understand it to be. Uh, there are alternative ways of defining ethnicity um, that are used by anthropologists, ethnographers, and others that are not racialized. <laughs> um, and can we use those, basically, can, you know, um, and, and do they maybe present also a challenge to, to the kind of claim that I just made, which is that um, ethnicity is almost inherently a racialized term. And I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I guess um, it's possible that one could, you know, do a study and sort of say, I'm using the term ethnicity, and this is what I mean by it, and and step as a category of analysis, um, and um, separate it from these other histories that I'm talking about. Um, on the other hand, I guess uh, it is hard in some ways to disassociate. Um, the two, right? So there, there's, um, 
the, the history of, of ethnicity as a category of practice that's been used in all of these um, racializing ways, really, um, to distinguish that from uh, another use of ethnicity as a category of analysis in which it's it means something else. Um, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's just I think it's just important not to use the term without consideration or reflection about what you're doing and 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 also how your readers or your audience, I guess, will whether it's students or other scholars or a broader audience will receive that term. Um, but yeah, I, I thank you for for that um, reminder, of course, that there are other ways of absolutely other ways of understanding ethnicity. Um, I don't think it's impossible to imagine another another kind of definition that would be useful um, in some way. Thank you very much. We have two more questions and I invited both colleagues. One of them is Nicolaus Hagen and another one is uh, yeah, Thomas Off. So who wants to start? Thomas, I think you will. You, you will. Okay, uh, I'll start. Um, Thank you. I, I want to <laughs> I want to start by just thanking um, Tara for that wonderful um, talk, uh, which is just you know so typically uh, provocative and, and interesting. I, I really love it. Um, uh, but I, I want to ask you, Tara, if you could explain a little bit more about how you imagine um, substituting you know, racialization for ethnicization um, would actually work in, in practice um, in Eastern Europe, I mean, in the, the hands of historians using these as analytical categories, uh, because I'm not, I'm not completely sure uh, mm -hmm. exactly what you, your intention really is. I also wanna ask you if maybe encouraging um, you know, national groups, Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, whatever, to think of themselves in racialized terms, you know, presents particular problems in the American context by diminishing um, the kind of, uh, well, they can cast themselves as victims of racism, um, which has obviously um, a very problematic valence in the United States, um, where you know we are, of course, used to understanding racism in purely black and white terms, and that's problematic in its own way. Um, but by encouraging um, national groups from Eastern Europe to think of themselves in, in racialized terms, it can um, diminish potentially the impact of uh, Black-white uh, racial categorizations in the United States in particular. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's great to see you. And, and thank you for that question, which is um, really provocative and, and thoughtful. Um, I, I think, you know, this is where it gets to kind of the political um, consequences of historical work. And um, I think on some level, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't, I'm not arguing that uh, Czechs and Poles and so on are races. <laughs> um, I'm trying to, to show that there was a historical moment and process by which um, these groups were racialized um, as white um, and um, kind of really trying to draw on, um, but, but not quite white, right? So trying to draw on whiteness studies, I guess, to um, reflect upon that, that liminal status. And on some level, you're right that it does mean um, that it does mean acknowledging uh, that to some extent, um, you know, East European immigrants were um, victims of racial discrimination in the 1920s. You know, um, that's not to make make that that they were also beneficiaries of racial privilege at the same time. That's precisely what I'm saying about the liminal status. And 
Um, I totally agree with you that that message could be, you know, used in a sort of nefarious way to, you know, and it has been right. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's been done um, by uh, nationalist uh, groups in, in the U S um, but it's um, nonetheless, I think a, a, an accurate if or a valid perspective on the historical moment. Um, so whether you know we should shy away from that because it could be inconvenient politically right now. Um, I don't know. I think it would be more important just to be really clear that of what what one is saying, not that um, not that race is an accurate descriptive category but rather that racialization is um, something that, that took place and that East Europeans were both, um, again, kind of beneficiaries of and, um, and uh, discriminated against at the same time. Um, but it's a very good question. And I'm really interested in, in politics, obviously, and the political implications of the work I'm doing. So I'm, I'm gonna keep thinking about it and I, be interested in other people's thoughts too. I just invited Nicolaus Hahn because he put a very, very interesting question into the chat box, but I think we still have time to discuss. Yes. Nicolaus, are you here? Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> I just didn't expect to be on screen. So uh, thank God I had now three minutes to move all the crap out of the way from behind there. So that's why I wrote. Oh, thank you so much for the, for the talk. Um, I, I think it's uh, in line with uh, the questions and comments before. I thought it was very interesting when you remarked how immigrants to the United States from Europe had their ethnicities and, and nationalities, um, even though that was complicated too, as in the case of Austria, but then everyone else just had their race in a, in a sense. And I thought then this, this is such a remarkable distinction and and Obviously, as you also told us, ethnicity is always entangled with the concept of race. And then you went on to argue for, for looking closer at this ra uh, racialization in Europe. But then I thought, isn't this example remarkable in how different the two concepts, in a sense, work? Or, I mean, even though they're entangled, they, they seem to be different, right? Why, why is everyone else just one race and Europeans are an ethnic, have multiple ethnicities. And then I continue to wonder just how much concepts such as white or being on the margins of white make a lot of sense in this colonial uh, or post-colonial US uh, state, but are concepts that are probably not so important for, for the Europeans in Central Europe themselves. I mean, you gave the example of Czechoslovakia where it was quite easy to just, you know, become Czech or, or switch to being German. And that would also mean switching between being Slavic and, and German in a sense. And then would one just, you know, switch from being on the margins or in this liminal sphere of, of, of whiteness to, to, uh, and to being in the center of it. So, these were just some questions that came to mind. So I, I wondered what might be the, the limits of, you know, using this concept in back in Europe. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, um, I guess one thing I, I could have talked more about in, um, in my own uh, presentation is the work um, I've done previously on emigration, because I think in thinking about um, the relevance of race and racial liminality uh, within the region itself. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm drawing a lot on the, the work I did on emigration where I think I could see very clearly that um, a lot of emigration policy in the region, um, anxieties about emigration uh, and attempts to restrict and manage emigration uh, was based in a kind of um, anxiety about um, racial status. Again, in a global context, not in a local context, but th this idea that if that our emigrants who are going to 
work on plantations in Brazil or in the American South um, or even in a factory in Detroit um, are going to be treated as though they are not white. And that language is actually used as though they are slate, as though they are black, as though they are um, you know, not European, as though they are not from the civilized world. So I, I you know, that, that rhetoric is present already in the late 19th century um, among uh, consuls and diplomats and, you know, people in the interior ministries and so on and so forth. Whether it's it, whether it comes up um, in a very local context, like you know, I I don't know. Probably not in the same way. Um, I, it, it seems to me that one has to. It's only when one takes a global perspective that you can see the effects. Where it does take a have a, um, take kind of resonate locally is within the United States. Um, and the, you know, there is a lot of this work in kind of whiteness studies that's shown you know, this history of how did Irish, Jews, Italians, Poles, and so on come to be seen as white within the US, which um, was a, you know, a historical development. It wasn't um, there from the outset. Um, so there, I think you would see once those migrants are transplanted that the term, whiteness becomes relevant to their daily lives in a different way. Um, so yeah, I think what it, it's within the context of migration history in a way that these are these that this idea of the borderlands of whiteness um, mo first resonated for me and I think maybe is most resonant for um, officials and ordinary people even. Raul has another question. Yeah, if I may just comment. follow up on this because it's it, it's really interesting. And I've I've done some work with the concept of whiteness on Jews in Eastern Europe and especially in Romania in terms of anti-Semitism. And I think whereas whiteness was a concept I brought into the study and one that the historical actors wouldn't have used themselves, they do speak a lot in terms of colonized and colonizers, the two, the two terms that you've mentioned. This is an age of colonialism. I think the anxiety of Romanian elites is on the one hand not being colonized, especially by Germans. On the other hand, they do have their own colonial aspirations, right? And that's where the Jews fit right in, because they can stand for both. They can stand for this ambiguous position where on the one hand, you'd very much like to be a colonizer, but on the other hand, you're afraid of being colonized. And therefore you project this onto the minority in your country that's most significant along those lines. And I think you can see a similar thing happening in Eastern Europe after 1918, various of these minorities occupying the, the position in between colonizer and colonized much more than they would use whiteness uh, in terms of, uh, again, the, the language of historical actors. And I think this relationship between the majority and the minority also brings us to the scale that you mentioned, Deva mentioned, which I think is very important. But there is a clear limit in Eastern Europe, and that's the Roma, which are unambiguously seen racially at this time, I would argue and which to this day remain the, the race problem of Eastern Europe. If you, if you look at, the, at what's, what's going on right now, the, the, the murder of um, Stanislav Tomas in, in the Czech Republic by a police officer, immediately the, the, the association with George Floyd was made. This was the, the, the Roma George Floyd, the Czech George Floyd. Um, and it's very much an unaddressed issue, I think. And that's where I think Discussing this in terms of race, uh, maybe counter the argument of, of Thomas earlier, might actually be something that Eastern Europe needs, politically speaking, um, because it's a discussion that I think we need to have, and a discussion that hasn't happened so far. And I was personally hoping to see it more in the wake of Black Lives Matter, but and I think it incrementally has moved in that direction in academia, but I think it's useful to think in the, to think in terms of race also for this reason, um, in, in my opinion at least. Thanks. I mean, that's a that's a really great, a better answer to the question than I was able to offer. But I think you're right that that um, that kind of fear of being colonized and aspiration to colonize, uh, which you know is enacted in all these various um, relationships with minorities after 1918, is a is a great example and. And I agree. I mean, I would just really like 
to be a to see and engage in a discussion about you know race as a as a historical um, and analytic category in Eastern Europe and and see where it gets us. You know, it's not to say I I you know I think there there's possible there's all sorts of room for pushback or nuance, um, but it seems like get, especially given current events to me that it it it's an important conversation to have. I, I just, uh, I, I don't know, it, it can be very, very far. But if you if you follow the US development in the Roma, Roma history writing, just because you started to discuss, um, there is a kind of uh, strategical essentialism uh, uh, represented by Roma historians and Roma social scientists. Uh, they use uh, the categories of ethnicity and race in a totally different uh, way. Although they historicize this argumentation with the slavery of the 19th century, the, the uh, feudal structure, so, so the, uh, 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 the feudal uh, um, uh, exclusion of, from society uh, in the late 19th century, etc. So they establish a kind of social history and history, historiography, but they use ethnicity and race in a fully different and liberative way. So it's also, so I, this is why I ask whether we can, whether we can deliberate the category of ethnicity because it's a kind of uh, playground. So, uh, and then we, if, we could, if we could go back to, to friendly bad category. So this, this ongoing uh, negotiation, which is, which is for me a, a, a rather attractive way of living <laughs> in, a, in a certain territory. So I, I just wonder whether we can um, open the, the, the playground for, for these categories and not just uh, uh, combining them with racism and, uh, and nationalism, et cetera, because they are absolutely politicized uh, uh, forms of, uh, of living. And as, uh, as Thomas mentioned, uh, no one declared themselves as a, as, as a racist or as a nationalist or an ethnic, ethnic Romanian. No, it's not easy. Oh, in, a neighbor, yeah. in a neighborhood, oh, it's, yeah. it's extremely complicated. It's, it's what a, you were saying just reminds me of one. It's, it's a cute anecdote, but I think it illustrates the, the point. At the time when scientific racism was seen as science and it was seen as respectable, the Romanian anti-Semites are responding to accusations of being then discriminating against Jews on the basis of religion by saying, well, this is not about religion. Our, yeah. our anti-Semitism is state of the art. It's racist. It's, it's scientific. Yes. Because previously, interventions have been in the name of, of humanitarianism, which was on religious grounds and so on. So in, the, in, in 1878, around the time of uh, discussions about Jewish emancipation in Romania, they are making the point that theirs is top-notch scientific racism of the German variety, not this backward East European discrimination yes. on the basis of religion. Yeah. So they are very much taking these labels on. Today they wouldn't, sure. <laughs> but back then, being a, a racist was proof of you being advanced, of being Western, of being European, of belonging to the civilized order of nations. Don't so forget. they are not. Yes, of course. And don't forget that well, there is an ethnic and racial studies that I want to turn Sorry, Tara. <laughs> This is a great conversation. Uh, I, you know, you can't. I, I'm certainly not trying to ban any words from con or concepts from use, and that would be foolish anyway. Because, as you said, I mean, ethnicity and race have, are categories of practice, and you know, um, so they are worthy of analysis from that perspective. Um, but uh, yeah, so. That wouldn't be my point. I think the Roma um, history of Roma and both the way race has been applied to that group and and their own appropriation of race and ethnicity is, is a kind of really important history within this discussion. And um, yeah, I have a student who's working on it in Hungary, and uh, I think it'll be really 
really great work when he's finished, uh, but lots of others are as well. And it, it's really very important to this conversation. So thank you so much. It, it, yeah, it also shows how inspiring uh, your lecture was for us. And then maybe, unfortunately, you cannot come. Can you guys hear Tara? Because I can't. I can hear. OK. OK. Would you like to? I think we couldn't hear you, the, the, the second half of your response. Me? Oh. Yes, we could. You couldn't, you couldn't maybe. <laughs> maybe your headset uh, is not, not perfect, Alex. But I just wanted to say uh, goodbye. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, well, Tara. It was extremely inspiring, and we will we will bring uh, um, uh, it to, to, for tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and I hope I'll be able to. I, I, I can't get up too early, but I, I'll try to get up as early as I can so I can be at some of the presentations tomorrow. Um, I, I wish we could be having this conversation in, all together in person because I think it's an important one. So I hope there'll be a follow up of some kind. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And have a thank nice, you. have a nice afternoon. Have a nice evening, and see you tomorrow at ten o'clock uh, in Central Europe. <laughs> Bye bye everyone. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.